This is the Chapel Real Estate Show, episode number 10. Welcome to the Chapel Real Estate Show, your source for the latest real estate information so you can buy, sell, and invest with the best in Texas. Whether you're a first-time buyer, a current homeowner, or a seasoned investor, you've come to the right place. We're here to simplify all things real estate so you can achieve your goals of property ownership with your hosts, Daniel and Roger Chapel. Hey, 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 thank you for tuning in to the Chapel Real Estate Show, your source for the latest real estate information so that you can learn how to buy, sell, and invest with the best. I'm your host, Daniel Chapel, and I'm here with my co-host, Roger Chapel. How are you doing today, Dad? I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? Oh, it's another great day. So today we're talking about some really, really important information, and it's going to be how to win bids in the Austin, Texas market. So as most of you have probably heard, if you've been watching the real estate market, um, Austin, along with a lot of other areas around the country, is just going absolutely insane. Uh, the, the market right now is just inundated with buyers and not just looky-loo buyers, but really serious buyers that are pre-qualified, ready to submit offers, and there is almost no inventory. So, you know, I mean, Dad, do you remember how low the number was in inventory supply as far as the entire Austin area in Abor, like last week? Uh, well, just yesterday, it was 1705. That is just crazy. And remind me, what is the average that we usually see in a, in a little bit more of a stable market? Well, I actually broke it down to just Williamson County. So mind you, ABOR, the Austin Board of Realtors, covers a very large area, multiple counties throughout Central Texas. So on in a regular market, we're used to seeing well over 5,000 properties uh, on uh, uh, on the open market. However, to have 1,700 in the entire region is unheard of. And when we narrowed it down to just Williamson County, there were 404, and that was on Saturday. Wow. That, that's unheard of. That, that's unheard of. We're typically somewhere around the 2,500 range in Williamson County, and now we have a whole 404. And that was as of Saturday. I didn't check it today. Uh, but I'm sure as of today, it's even further lower because, you know, over the weekend, I'm, I'm certain uh, multiple properties went under contract. So Absolutely. we'll start seeing some more hit the market here coming up, hopefully uh, very soon. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I mean, we've been seeing this crazy song and dance the, the last, what, it's been about a month and month and a half. So now that just offers are going crazy high. Um, you know, we put my house on the market last weekend and got inundated with offers. Um, and we were kind of curious how this market around the Austin area was going to impact Kyle, where I was at a little bit further south. And I'll tell you, it's it's definitely catching up to what's going on in the rest of the Austin area. We've heard we've heard crazy offers, you know, hundreds of offers on single properties. We didn't get that high, but I mean, we were definitely up in the double digits. And I mean, it's it's more than what we expected for sure. So, yeah. <clears throat> um, so yeah, basically today's topic is how, how as a buyer are you supposed to make your offers look a little bit more attractive and increase your chances of being able to get one of these, you know, very few houses that are on the market under contract. So we're really excited to bring all this information to you guys, but let's first talk about, um, you know, what, what is dad, uh, dad, what has been your experience so far working with some of your clients and how have you been able to get some of your offers accepted in this crazy market right now? Well, actually, I've had quite a bit of practice over the last several years. It's been, uh, I've been involved in a number of multiple offer situations and been quite successful in getting these offers accepted. Now, today's market is a completely different animal. Uh, so my, my uh, definition of success has kind of shifted a little bit because we have a number of buyers that, I mean, we're submitting multiple, you know this, uh, we're submitting multiple offers before finally something gets accepted. But I think uh, uh, I've, I've found a way that if the buyers are willing to do it, uh, then there's a way uh, that we can make the offer more attractive and at least make it to the final stages uh, of selection, uh, which gives them a better shot at it. It doesn't always mean they're gonna win it, but it does mean that they're gonna get a better shot at it uh, and hopefully not pay too much more for the house than what it's, what it's actually worth. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> what are some of the strategies that you've found pretty effective in, in making sure that the offers that you're presenting are, um, you know, attractive to the sellers? 
Well, one of the things is I have to, as a service to the clients, I truly need to understand contracts, the ins and outs, and some of the nuances in these contracts to make them more attractive over some of the others. And there's a number of things in there that, that we can do, uh, both the buyer and the buyer's agent, to be able to make one offer more attractive than some of the others. Uh, it's basically, you've got to do some out, outside the box thinking as well. Uh, and we'll get into some of that here in a little bit. And, and I've uh, a few strategies that are, are effective. Uh, I haven't used all of them, but I have learned a few of them that I think are very effective. Uh, there's been some others that I have been able to use myself uh, that are very, very effective. And then finally, and probably one of the most important factors is communication with the listing agent. Uh, and I've gotten very good about communicating with the listing agent, trying to create some sort of rapport with that agent, because uh, one thing that's not in the contracts, that's also not very well um, played up by the agents, in my opinion, is the relationships between the agents. Uh, and you and I both know, because we've been in this situation before, where our offers were accepted over other offers, because the agents knew us and our work ethic and how we're going to try to uh, get to the closing table versus trying to uh, find some way to, to mess the thing up, which, you know, sometimes realtors, we get in our own way. And uh, we've learned, uh, I think you and I both have learned how to stay away from that, that uh, kind of a problem. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the biggest thing is to learn how to play offense, right? We stay ahead of the game. You got to know what what uh, potential hiccups might be on the way and find a way to get ahead of them. So, um, well, let's uh, let's kind of dive into the chapel chunk for the day. So um, as both a buyer and a seller, you're going to want to make sure that you and your chosen professional truly understand the contracts and the ramifications of the contracts. Um, so we'll get into a few examples as we get into the episode, um, but every little checkbox on that contract means something. And usually there's going to be a dollar amount attached to that little checkbox. So, um, you know, owner's title policies, things of that nature, surveys, what do those things cost? Um, and how can you make uh, use those things to make your offer look a little bit more attractive? So that's going to be your chapel chunk. Make sure you're working with a professional uh, that understands the contracts and explains them to you so that you understand what are those you know, what are the costs going to be at the closing table um, if you if you choose to check that box. So um, moving into the day's episode. So um, like we said, we're going to get into some of the ramifications of the contract. So let's talk specifics. Um, Dad, title policy and survey. What do they cost? Uh, who typically pays for them? And how can we use those things to make the offer more attractive? Okay, so uh the owner's title policy in the past is typically a seller's expense. So what does that mean? Anytime we're negotiating these contracts as uh, the buyer's agent and the seller's agent, uh, typically we want to try to benefit our client in the best way that we possibly can. And that's not just financial. It's also about many of the terms in the contract. So uh, owner's title policy typically is a seller's expense, but not always. It's always negotiable. So in today's market, then it's most likely, if you really want that house as the buyer, then you should go ahead and pay for your own title policy. But here's one of the benefits to that. You pay for your own title policy, you're gonna choose your own title company and the seller has absolutely no fight in that, uh, with that whatsoever. They will go to whatever title company we choose to go to. We meaning the, the buyer and the buyer's agent. So uh, that's just one of many benefits on that. Uh, so what was the other part of the question, Daniel? Um, what do they cost um, and how can we use them to strengthen the offer? Right. So uh, the cost depends on the uh, amount of the house. So the, the dollar amount of the house. So if you're in a contract for 300000 there is a percentage of whatever. And I don't know what that percentage is. That's the title company's deal. But I do know in Texas, it's regulated. So every title company has the same charge. Now, there are other fees that are associated with it that wind up costing a little bit more. And some of those fees are the buyer's fees. Some of those fees are the seller's fees. Uh, and, you know, according to the contract, there's no way to split those fees up. But that's not to say that as the buyer, you can't do some things to make your offer more attractive. So uh, absorbing the cost of that, you know, on average out of here, uh, typically it's around $2,000 for a title policy. Not always, but let's assume for the sake of this conversation, it's going to be around $2,000. Okay. Yeah. Surveys, I mean, $2,000 you, you, $2, for a seller definitely makes a, a big difference when you're talking about, you know, the, the seller's proceeds at, at the end of the transaction. So every dollar counts. 
And on the flip side of that, that $2,000 is an additional $2,000 out of the buyer's pocket in addition to the price of the house. So there, there are costs associated with that. So it's literally moving a pile of money from one place and shifting it over to somewhere else. But that money's not going away. It's just going to a different person. Uh, so uh, with that said, you got, uh, I think you mentioned surveys earlier. Uh, surveys are another big portion of this too. So anytime a buyer is using a lender, the lender is going to require a survey. So typically the seller will submit their existing survey to the title company. Now, mind you, this is in the state of Texas. Each state is a little bit different. They have their own method of doing things. So I'm only talking specifically about Texas. So here, when the uh, seller submits their uh, survey to the title company, they're looking to have it approved. What does that mean? That means that an attorney has reviewed it, deemed it to be a legal document. It's legible. They can tell all the different points on the on the survey, all the different uh, setbacks and easements and things of that nature. Those are clearly identified. Sometimes there's a swimming pool or there may be some other addition uh, to the uh, uh plat or the, the survey, the lot itself, but as long as it's within the constraints of the, the uh, build lines, everything should be copacetic. Now, with that said, sometimes they're not. And if they're not, that means a new survey is going to have to be obtained. Well, that's one of those little check boxes on the contract. So now who's going to pay for that? That's always negotiable. But in today's market, it's probably pretty wise if the seller pays, I'm sorry, the buyer pays for that. Take it away from the seller, put it as a buyer's expense. So again, that's another chunk of change that goes to the buyer that they may have to pay. Now, how much does a survey cost? That literally depends on a number of factors. Number one, the size of the lot that needs to be surveyed. Number two, how busy these survey companies are, whether or not we need to put a rush on the survey. Uh, because again, remember, lenders always require surveys. Cash deals do not, they don't care. If I'm a cash buyer and I want to buy the property, I'm buying the property. I'll get my survey later on. So, I mean, I don't need that. A lender is not going to require it from me because I'm not using a lender. So uh, on a cash deal, that's, that's not a big deal. But on, on any kind of a loan, then the survey is going to be an expense to someone. Hopefully there's an existing survey and it's approved by the title company and this is a non-issue. But if it does become an issue, you want to make sure that on your offer that I mean, if you really love the house as a buyer, you want to make sure that you make that as your own expense. And to be honest with you, as the buyer, if I'm doing that, I probably want my own survey anyway, if it's not been approved. And I, I'll pay for it myself and, and find my own surveyor. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> so one of the other uh, big expenses that, you know, uh, when we got inundated with offers on our house, this was something that we were pretty interested in, in paying attention to because it shows how uh, serious the buyer is and how likely they are to continue on and proceed with uh, purchasing of the property. And that's gonna be the earnest and the option money. So uh, dad, can you explain to us the difference between the earnest and the option money and uh, what you know, is pretty typical to, to pay up front for those, those fees and what does it look like in today's market? So I would say before the last two months, uh, we could say we were more in a, a very typical market where earnest money was typically 1% of whatever the sell, uh, sales price of the house is. So on a $300,000 house, the earnest money would be $3,000. The option money typically is $15 to $20 a day. So if you want uh, five days, you know, $200, five days uh, would be actually pretty high. You could go $100 for five days, $150. But the higher that option money goes, the more serious the buyer looks, especially when you have a very short option period, because the option money in the state of Texas does not come back to the buyer unless they close. So in other words, when I write that check to you as the seller, that check goes directly to you as the seller. You do with it what you will. I will only get credit towards my closing costs if I get to closing. If I decide during that option period to terminate my contract, then I lose that option money. The purpose of that option money is, is twofold. Number one, it's for the buyer to be able to conduct their inspections and uh, do what we call their due diligence. That includes the home inspection, roof inspection, maybe electrical, maybe sewage or septic or plumbing, who knows. But that it gives time to have all those things uh, not only inspected, but possibly get cost estimates for repairs. That's one part of it. The other part of it is to uh, 
take one more look at your financing to make sure that you're, you're got the money that you really need. You're able to access the funds when you need to, because sometimes there's a delay in that. Uh, you want to make sure that you have all that together so that you can actually get to the closing table. Because during that option period, I can withdraw my offer for any reason or no reason. It does not matter. I can withdraw it. I, I will get my earnest money back, but I will not get my option money. Now, earnest money, what does that mean? Earnest money is typically a fee. Now, the best way to, for me to define it anyway is an earnest money is a fee paid by a buyer to the title company to show their interest in a, in a property. So what that does is it takes it off the market and it shows that, okay, this is my deposit, if you will, on that property. Now, buyers in the state of Texas have over 30 ways to get out of the contract and still get their earnest money back. Sellers don't. Once you agree to sell the house, you're selling the house. That's pretty much it. There's very few ways you can get out of it So, uh, as the seller. But as the buyer, there's a number of ways that a buyer can back out of a contract and still get their earnest money back. However, if they're in violation of their contract in some kind of way, they breach that contract, then part of the remedy to that is that the seller gets to keep that option money. I'm sorry, that earnest money. So if you want to show that you're serious about purchasing a house, and I just did this on an offer recently, you submit a large chunk of earnest money. What you're showing there is that you've got true skin in the game so that I'm less likely to violate the conditions of my, my contract because I sure don't want to lose that big chunk of money. For example, on that $300,000 house we just mentioned, earnest money typically is $3,000. What some of my buyers are doing is doing a $10,000 earnest money check. That's three times what's normal. By doing that, that gets noticed because guess what? Now I've got real skin in the game and I don't like losing $10,000. So I'm probably gonna go through every step of this and make sure that, that uh, I can get this house because uh, so, I sure don't want to take a chance on losing my, my $10,000. So uh, that's just one of, uh, of the strategies that we, we implement. Yeah. And, it, and definitely as a seller, um, you know, I, I definitely took notice. I want to know that whoever is, is looking to purchase the home is likely to continue on because, right, I mean, every, every month in the house counts. Every, every dollar spent on utilities and a mortgage payment and everything else, every delay that could possibly come up in closing, having to go back on the market if the buyer decides to withdraw the contract, all of that costs the seller money. So, um, you know, that, all that definitely makes a, makes a big difference on whether or not the seller is going to pay attention to your offer or not. Um, so exactly. something else that, that uh, sellers tend to look for is, you know, especially in today's market, are leasebacks. Because when, when does the buyer want to take possession of the home? When do they want to close on the home? So let's kind of talk about that for a second, Deb. So in today's market, what we saw after COVID is our inventory took a dramatic decrease. We were already a very strong sell seller's market, but because everybody pulled their homes off the market, our, our inventory just plunged. Well, in the meantime, the other thing that plunged was new home inventory because now there's no resale on the market. So new homes started flying off the shelves. So now all of a sudden we don't have any new home sales either. So there's been a whole ripple effect throughout the industry on for a number of reasons. There's so many, I mean, this podcast is too short for us to, to cover all of that. However, with that said, the, um, uh, uh, the leasebacks have become kind of a big deal because a lot of sellers are selling their homes, but their house that they're moving into isn't completed yet. Or uh, they can't really purchase another home until they've closed on their home because they need the proceeds from that. And they really need to make their offer look just as strong as the one they accepted on the next home that they're looking to purchase. And as fast as our market is moving today, uh, I mean, these buyers have to be ready to pounce like right now and buy right now and count on probably paying more for the house than what they could just two, three, six months ago. So with that uh, expectation, they have to understand, I mean, I mean, if you're selling a house and you're also buying a house at the same time, you, you truly, you talk about stressful, it's extremely stressful. So what I have seen here lately is most of the buyers, uh, many of the buyers that are, I'm sorry, many of the sellers right now, that are leaving this, this market, they're putting a house on a market and they're leaving Texas. So if they're leaving Texas, they don't necessarily need a lease back. If they're staying in the area, they could need a lease back. This is why your professional buyer's agent needs to have great communication with the listing agent. So typically what I do is I reach out to the listing agent 
what do your sellers need? Because it's not just the money. Yes, that is one factor. I know how to make that factor uh, better for the seller. I also know how to make that so that I can protect the buyer if I need to do that. But if the buyer really wants and loves that house, then I know how to get that done if they're willing to listen to me and if they're willing to actually pay more for that house. So with that said, I'm also going to reach out to the listing agent. Mr. Listing agent, what does your buyer need? Well, they're closing on a house in two months. They need a 60 or 90 day lease back. Okay. So what does that mean? Now, there are several things we can do there. What is a lease back? A lease back means that a seller sells the house and they close on it, but they stay in the house and now they become a tenant. The buyer now becomes the owner and the landlord. So for the next 60 to 90 days, that have that landlord tenant relationship. We have contracts or we have addendums that we can attach to our contracts to allow for that sort of thing. Now, I have seen several things win offers over. One of them is a free lease back. Typically the free lease back is usually about a month because you got to figure once you close on a house, you know, as the new owner, your first payment isn't due for at least a month, sometimes six weeks down the line. If that's the case, it's basically a wash. I don't really care if I make money on or charge somebody something else if there's no money needed to be exchanged anyway. To me, that's a wash. Now, after that period, and I have my first mortgage payment due, that's when I might entertain possibly charging a daily fee to, to uh, uh, operate that lease back. So that's always prorated. It usually is broken down per day. So if my mortgage payment is, you know, say $2,000 uh, and there's another six weeks left, I'll count the number of days divide that by 2,000 or uh, 3,000, depending on how long it is, break it down at a cost per day and then charge it per day. So uh, that's one thing that we can do. There's a number of things that can be done and negotiate. And on occasion, I've seen it where the buyers, the new buyer coming in will offer a 90 day free lease back. Well, what that means is that buyer is actually going to pay a mortgage payment before the, the uh, now tenant moves out, if that makes sense. Yeah. Absolutely. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I mean, that, that was a great explanation of leasebacks. I mean, understanding the, the costs associated with them, the, the time difference between closing and your first mortgage payment. And I mean, yeah, that's a great strategy, especially when you talk about sellers that need to stay in their homes to make your offer look a little bit more attractive. Um, you know, a lot of people might not look at it that way. They may think, you know, as looking at it as an expense, you know, that mortgage payment could be due the day that I close. Well, no, that's not really the case. It's, you've got a little bit of leeway there. So um, that's a great, great strategy. Um, so another little um, tidbit to the contract that uh, isn't a huge expense, but does make a difference on the, you know, the final cost at the closing table. And that's gonna be residential service contracts or more commonly known as a home warranty. So um, what do they cost? What are they for? Who usually pays for them? Um, Dad, let's get into it. So the home warranty is typically paid for by the seller and it usually comes out of the proceeds and gets paid at closing. And it's basically a gift from the seller to the buyer. Uh, a lot of times I've heard sellers say, you know what, I just want to make sure that the buyer gets a good quality home. So that's kind of how that, that whole thing works. Around here, they typically cost somewhere around $600, depending on some of the things that you need to add to it. A uh, pool can be added. Uh, you know, the water heater and, and some of the other appliances, washer, dryer, refrigerator, all those have an additional cost to them. But typically the, the crux of the, the main basic warranty is around $600 a year. So typically uh, for my buyers, if they're really looking to do that, if they really need a home warranty, I will tell them, I will buy your home warranty personally. So we, that's not even going to be a part of this conversation. We're not even going to talk about it. I'm not going to put it on your, con on your contract. You're getting a home warranty. I'm going to give it to you. So we're not even going to worry about that. So that's one strategy that's been, been very helpful. It's less stress on the, on the buyer as well. And they're already paying enough money. $600 is not that big of a deal uh, in a grand scheme of things. But to the buyer, that can, that can mean a lot. So uh, it is one additional thing added on to them that they don't have to worry about any longer. So that's my strategy on that. Uh, but... Uh, other realtors may not want to do that. That's fine. That's truly fine. That's their business. So if they're not offering that, then it behooves the buyer, if he even wants a service contract, to go ahead and pay for it himself. And he doesn't even have to put it as part of the contract. He can if he wants to, but he can buy it offline 
but typically I have found that uh, they make it part of the contract, but it doesn't have to be. It's always negotiable. Yeah. <clears throat> well, that's great. So um, moving into the next, uh, the next topic, and that's going to be third parties to the contract. So, um, you know, we've talked about option periods. We've talked about um, some of the different things that you can do to strengthen an offer. So uh, third parties to the contract, there's a few of them that we want to touch on. Inspectors, um, and appraisers are one of them. Lenders is going to be uh, the last one. So let's talk about inspectors first. Um, this kind of ties in with the option period. So, um, Dad, what are uh, what are some of the inspectors that are going to be coming by the property? What's the purpose of doing this um, and having them come by? And uh, you know what what can you do to uh, make the option look more attractive? So inspections, at least with the buyers that I work with, uh, are highly recommended. Uh, I don't, you know, I made the mistake one time of buying a house and did not have it inspected uh, because I was going to be remodeling like your mom and I, and we already knew that we were going to do some things with it. But I, sh I should have had that house inspected because there were so many problems with that house that were not disclosed to us that would have been discovered in the home inspection. So, uh, I mean, there was even a fire in this house and that was never disclosed to us. Now, it could be that the owner before us didn't know about it because it, it was obvious that it was there for a long time, but even still, th that fire should have been disclosed. And I found out later on that the, the seller that sold it to us knew nothing about a fire either. So when he bought it, they never disclosed it to him. So, uh, I mean, th there's different things that can pop up that truly that need to be looked at. Uh, termites, uh, termite inspection is another one. You never know if you've got termites or not until all of a sudden you're having to repair the damage. And then by that time, it's too late. You've got active termites, now you've got to treat for them, and then you've got to remediate all the damage. So uh, the inspections are very, very important. Now, with that said, sometimes, you know, we were talking a minute ago about the option period. So when we move towards the option period, we have an option period as part of our contract. That is the period of time when the buyer actually performs or conducts all of the inspections on the property. They may also want to go ahead and get repair estimates so that they know how much it's going to cost them to do these repairs or how much they're going to ask from the seller uh, towards repair costs and things of that nature. So that's why that's there to begin with. Uh, some of the other inspections you mentioned. Um, so it depends on the property. So there are some properties that have a pool. There's some that have uh, the wells especially out in, in central Texas. Then we have other properties that uh, are connected to regular sewage lines, or maybe they've been in a flood zone, or uh, maybe they've been damaged through a tornado. Who knows? There could be any number of, of issues that come up. So when these issues come up, we want to have professionals take a look at some of the things that we suspect. So for example, roof inspection. This happens all the time. We have our inspectors take a look at the house. The house looks great. They get on the roof. They see roof damage that was caused by a recent hailstorm, and typically the roofer or the inspector says, "You know what? You need to have a roofing professional take a look at this." So sure enough, we call our roofing professionals, have them come up, take a look at it, and then they make their recommendation as to repair or replacement. Again, all of this typically will take place during that option period. Now, one of the strategies to win the bid over is to waive the option period. Just because a buyer is waiving an option period doesn't mean they're waiving their inspection on the property. So instead, what I would try to do is negotiate with the seller or the seller's agent saying, we're going to have the property inspected, uh, but there's not going to be an option period. We want it inspected sooner rather than later. Uh, so just uh, allow that to occur. And they almost always occur. I've not had a single time where a seller said no, uh, but I'm sure maybe they would, but uh, I, I haven't had that experience yet. They've always agreed to the inspection. So that, that's on inspections. Okay. Yeah. And then just kind of a, a side note on the inspections is, um, you know, a, a way to make it look more attractive, right, is a shorter option period. So this kind of ties back into having a professional that has the relationships with some of these inspectors, because I know, you know, especially when, when there's an influx of inventory, not so much right now, inspectors can be very busy. And sometimes you can, you know, have an inspector not be available for five, seven, 10 days. Um, so, you know, it helps to have a relationship with not just one, but two or three different inspectors. So that you always have somebody that is going to be available. Um, you know, if you are in a competitive multiple offer situation, a three or a five day option period, or, or even a two day option period, being able to get an inspector out the next day, um, you know, th those are things that can make everything, you know, look more attractive. And then of course, speed up the process, which always, you know, 
can sometimes uh, uh, help your, your cases, through your case, excuse me. <clears throat> um, so another uh, topic or another uh, third party to the contract is gonna be the lender. So there's an addendum to the contract called the third party financing addendum. Um, nowadays, there's a lot of people that are, that are waiving the uh, financing period, waiving the appraisals that are associated with these third party financing uh, addendums if possible. So um, let's kind of dive into that and talk about what are some of the things that, that buyers are doing in today's market, right? With, uh, with lenders and third party financing. Yeah, so on most offers that are submitted today, there's what we call an appraisal waiver attached to the, the contract. What that means is that the buyer is truly waiving their appraisal. They don't care how much it appraises for it, they're gonna take the extra cash to closing. What does that mean? So let's assume we go back to this $300,000 house again. The buyer has paid $300,000 and they waive the appraisal. But just because the buyer waives the appraisal doesn't mean the lender is going to. The lender is still going to require an appraisal. So the appraisal comes back after it's completed and let's assume that it says that the house is appraised at 280. Well, that's a $20,000 difference. Who's gonna make up for that $20,000? Well, the buyer is. The buyer just waived the appraisal. So you wanna make sure as the seller, as the listing agent, that when that offer comes in, that the buyer can actually prove that they can afford to pay the difference. So that's another unique strategy that actually helped win over a, a recent listing I had because when that offer was submitted, not only did the buyer waive the appraisal, they sent proof of funds so that they had the money, they had the, the cash to be able to go over that appraisal without a problem. So that, that's a very big strategy that at least in my opinion, went over on this one offer uh, for sure. That was one of the biggest points. So appraisals are, are really a big deal. The other thing too, is that on that third party finance, at least in Texas, not only the buyer has to qualify, but so does the property. And there's no time limit on that property. For the buyer, they usually will have their financing approved for the buyer within 14, 15 days. That is about normal, especially if they are, are truly pre-approved uh, before they submit their offer. Pre-qualification is not the case. Pre-qualification may take them an additional week two weeks to get that done. However, if they're working with a lender that is local and it's really understands this competitive market, that lender is gonna get a lot of this work done on the beginning. And the only thing that they need is an actual contract in order to be able to get the loan to processing. Once it gets to processing, it's very quick before they can say a thumbs up or a thumbs down on the buyer. So that's one of those things that the shorter period to get the buyer approved, the better. The property is a different scenario. So this is where the loans come in and each type of loan is different. You know, when you have the federally backed loans, those homes aren't only appraised, they're also inspected by the appraiser. So if there are health and safety issues that come up, those things have to be taken care of before closing, which is why, and it's a very competitive market, the federally backed loans typically go to the bottom of the stack when you have conventional cash loan buyers moving up. And the reason being is that on conventional, they don't necessarily inspect the house uh, the same way that they do on some of these other. So with that said, uh, that's always one of the things to keep in mind on, on uh, uh, that, that particular strategy. Yeah. Um, and, and the other thing, you know, we're kind of talking about third parties to the contract and how they affect more or less the timelines. Um, so what has been your experience lately as far as um, appraisals and, you know, contracts that do have appraisals attached to them, um, you know, how is that affecting the timeline of the contract? That's a great question. So because our market is so competitive, we're seeing homes that are, that are listed at a really good price. And when I say a good price, they're listed at where they should appraise for, or, or at least very close to what they should appraise for. However, what we're seeing is that these homes are selling for 15, 20, 45% above listing price. What that means is, is that it's not going to meet appraisal. We as professionals know this when we see those offers, it's not going to meet appraisal. So if there is a loan that's attached to it and they don't have an appraisal waiver, they're probably not going to get the house. They're going to have to waive the appraisal to get that house. So that's in most instances. That's not every instance, but that's most. Now in Texas, we have three different answers to that appraisal waiver. Number one is a full out waiver. Number two is a partial waiver. A partial waiver means that it has to meet a certain amount. Uh, and once it meets that amount, at least that amount, then the buyer is good. If the appraisal does not meet that amount, then a buyer can walk away from it. 
So that's the partial appraisal. And then you have the other one that is where the appraisal is actually a, a, a thing, where it has to meet appraisal. Uh, if the house does not meet appraisal at all uh, at the, the list price or whatever the contract price is, then they go away. So how do we, how do I explain that? So let's go back to this $300,000 house. On a full waiver, it's $300,000. No matter where the appraisal comes in, the buyer is moving forward. They have the cash to make up the gap. On a partial waiver, let's assume that the, the buyer comes in and says, okay, I'll go 300, but the house has to appraise for at least 290 because I've only got $10,000 extra to take the closing. Now, if the house comes in at below 290, the buyer can still walk away. But if it comes in at 291, that's $9,000 extra dollars the buyer has to take to closing and they continue to move forward. On, a, uh, on the other one, let's assume that it has to appraise at 300. So if it comes in at 290, then that means the buyer can actually walk away. Now, typically, instead of allowing the buyer to walk away, then we're able to negotiate something out between the, the uh, seller and the buyer. Because remember, the agents do all the negotiating on all this, but the agents, it's not their contract. It is a contract between the buyer and the seller. The reason the agents are there are to ensure the protection of each of their clients and to make sure that they, they get a, a good, fair deal. Now, with that said, I have seen this on occasion where the agents get emotionally attached to these things. They shouldn't do that. Do not do that. That They're not doing their clients any favors by getting emotionally attached. This is a business. So what we do typically is when we've got two professionals working together, they're working together to try to get a deal done. Now, if the buyer is able to come up with an additional 5,000 and the seller is willing to go down another 5,000, we can meet in the middle and everybody is happy-go-lucky. It doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes the deal busts up over that, but just keep that in mind. Those, that's why the appraisal is so important. Now, I've also seen on occasion where there's a flaw with the appraisal. This doesn't happen very often, but it could happen. And in today's market, especially right now, we're starting to see some changes so that the appraiser may not be aware of some recent sales that have closed that actually bring the value of the house up. So if we notice that the appraisal is dramatically lower than it should be, and then we take, because we do get a chance as the buyer's agent to see the appraisal if the buyer will show it with, uh, share it with us. We can look at that appraisal and say, okay, well, he forgot about this house and this house and this house. So then we can go back and say, these are the three that I used to, to come up with the price point that we used Will that help with this? And sometimes they're able to make those adjustments. Sometimes they don't. It, it just depends. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, and and the time frames on appraisals right now, they're, I mean, how long? Roughly three yeah. weeks a month? It, it depends. You know, it used to be two weeks was about the standard. Right now, considering, you know, remember we had the, the freeze just a month ago. And uh, believe it or not, that delayed quite a bit because everything that was under contract that had already been appraised, uh, but hadn't closed, had to go back and get reappraised again or reinspected before they can move forward. Uh, so what they were doing then is these appraisers had to go back out and make sure that there were no plumbing leaks or, or other storm damage that could devalue the property. Uh, because if that did occur, then those things had to be taken care of before closing. But in the meantime, that also delayed the way that the appraisers are actually able to get other appraisals done the time factor. So what we're seeing now is three weeks to a month minimum. Uh, and I'm seeing now where some appraisals are coming in the day of closing or the day before wow. closing. So wow. yeah, I mean, they're really pushing it close uh, because we do our best to try to meet the closing date as best as possible. But if that appraisal can't make it in by the closing date, we have to extend. And nobody likes to do that. No, I mean, the buyers are anxious, the sellers are anxious, everybody's wanting to get to the closing table, but we're missing a document that just prevents that from happening. So now we've got to delay it. And then of course, people are taking off from work and all that. So it gets, that part of it gets a little frustrating. So on a cash deal, that's what makes cash deals so, uh, so good. That's also what makes appraisal waivers so good, uh, so attractive because we don't care if the appraisal makes it or not. The lender still cares, but on a cash deal, there is no appraisal in most instances, there's no appraisal. So it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, so last section, let's move into kind of new construction, because I know you've had quite a bit of success recently getting some of your clients under contract on new construction using some methods that, um, you know, most agents probably wouldn't think of and most clients wouldn't even consider as an option. So um, let's let's hear some of your success stories as far as what you've been able to accomplish in that in that front. 
So it's funny while we're doing this, I also thought of some other things. So circle back to this and remind me again. There's a couple other strategies that I've learned that uh, I haven't used yet, but I know other agents that have used them and have been successful. But new construction. So just recently, I've had two separate clients in the same week, literally. Uh, I was up uh, looking at some new houses with these new buyers. We already knew it was going to be at least six months before they could get into anything. Uh, I had already, uh, with one of these builders, they had to get pre-approved in order to get on a waiting list. So they had already gone to their lender and gotten the pre-approval. Both, both buyers did this. So, and I mean, two, two deals. It's funny how this thing worked out the way it did. So I go up, I meet with the sales agent an hour before my clients get there. And there's a couple of reasons I do that. Number one, I'm trying to create, again, the relationship with the sales agent. That, that to me is extremely important. Number two, I also want to see what other inventory they might have out there that's not listed on MLS. Number three, I really like going out there and seeing these areas as they grow because there's so much construction going on out here. I mean, we see so many different neighborhoods and I go in one of them and it's nothing but foundations laying out there on one week. I go out the following week and frames are up everywhere. So it's just crazy to see the growth and how rapidly that changes. So there, there's a number of reasons. But by talking with this other sales agent, I found that one house was that was supposed to close that day fell out of contract and the buyer didn't close on it one hour before our folks get there. So now this house is back on the market. It's not even officially on the market yet. It hasn't been released by, this, by the company yet. So until it gets released, they can't actually write a contract on it, but it's a completed house. And these are FHA buyers, by the way. So we go and we check out the house. They loved it. They love the yard. It's a huge yard in this, this neighborhood, which is unheard of. This is one of the larger yards in the neighborhood. So they fell in love with the house. They said, yeah, we're, we want to buy this one. So sure enough, the next day, I got them under contract on that house. The following day, I go out with another agent, another buyer, uh, a, veteran's, uh, a veteran buyer. He's using a VA loan. So again, these are federally backed loans, which are having a real hard time buying resale right now. So I had told him the same thing, get out there. Uh, we, there were two lenders uh, that he applied with, with two separate builders. Uh, but I had spoken with both builders and knew that there was product out there that would be available for his time frame. So I got them on the wait list. There was an extent, extensive wait list. But what I'm finding too is that even though the wait list may be 40 or 50 people long, a lot of those folks are on multiple wait lists. So when something comes up that they want, they jump on it, but they may not have taken their name off the wait list. So they actually move up that wait list much quicker than people think. So anyway, I have these folks on a wait list. I go and I meet them and another, I swear, is <laughs> lucky. Sometimes you create your own luck though. So I'm back out there again. I'm talking with this agent and found out that uh, I think it was five or six properties had just been released by that company that day for construction. They, the foundation's already done. The lumber was out there. Two of them had already been framed. And one of them was the exact same floor plan that my buyer was looking for. Went out there, showed them that, and mind you, it had only been released an hour earlier. Go out there, we take a look at that floor plan, loved it, wanted that house, boom, got them under contract that night. Wow. So it Man. does happen, but you really have to be on top of your game. You've got to create these relationships and then make sure you stay on top of the game. Just get out there. I mean, that's, that's what this is about anyway. Yeah, I'll tell you, part-time agents and what they call secret agents would not be able to get that done. No. <laughs> No, absolutely not. <clears throat> um, so let's circle back then. You said you've got some uh, some yeah. strategies that other agents have uh, been able to or have had some success. So let's hear about those too. Yeah, so think about this for a second. So you have a $300,000 house. It should be a $300,000 house, but you already know you're going to have to pay, let's say, 10 to 15% more. So now you're paying three forty-five. We're going to say fifteen percent. Now you're paying three hundred forty-five thousand dollars for this house plus all of the closing costs. Okay. What else can you do? Because there's another offer out there that's looking just as good as yours, but we're going to call that one a cash offer. In fact, it looks better because it is a cash offer, but you're doing conventional. It's your first time home. You've got a little bit of extra funding here. So you've been saving up for a long time and you really want this house. So what are some of the things that you can do? So one thing is why not offer to pay the seller's moving costs? or pay something towards their moving costs. You just simply tell the agent, hey, my guys are willing to give your buyer, your seller $5,000 towards their moving costs. Completely separate and apart from the deal, they'll pay it $5,000 to your mover for their, their costs. Or what about, you know what? 
I will pay for your hotel or I will pay for part of your travel expenses to get to your next destination or some of these other strategies that are truly thinking outside the box. What does the seller need? The seller's got a newborn and they're getting ready to travel across country. Well, what can you possibly do? What can you give them that's going to help them through all of this? Because it's extremely stressful. So uh, thinking outside the box and thinking, you know, what can I do for the seller? The other thing too that I've seen, um, and there, there's arguments both for and against this, are what I title the love letters. These are letters from the buyer to the seller, trying to explain a little bit about who they are and why they're so interested in this house. Uh, sometimes these things are, are prohibited, like in California, I don't think they're allowed to use those anymore. Uh, here in Texas, we're still allowed to use them. I'm not sure that I agree or disagree with them. Uh, to me, if the buyer wants to submit it, I'll submit that along with the offer. Uh, but on the listing side of it, I've been, I've received them and I've presented, uh, presented them with uh, some of the top offers to uh, my buyers or to my sellers before. And I don't know, I, I haven't seen it go that buyer's way yet, but it's not because they don't tuck the heartstrings. It's literally because there are other things in the contract that are more attractive with another offer than what theirs is, because it always goes back to the offer. It rarely goes to the, the love letter. It could, but it, it rarely, the love letter rarely affects the decision on the seller's part, but it, I guess it could. And then one of the final things is uh, I'm working a deal right now where the buyer initially was looking at uh, either a VA or a conventional loan, but then they had access to a tremendous amount of funds that could be borrowed from somebody else. So as we're discussing all of this and we're going through a house and I asked him, I said, so you're, you're looking to try to borrow the money, part of the money anyway, from, from some parents. And then you're also going to try to borrow some money from a lender. Is that correct? Yes. Why don't you just borrow all of the money from the parents? And then if the parents have that kind of money to loan you in cash, because he's already told me this, why don't they pay house, you know, cash for the house? The four of you go together on a contract, you pay cash for it. After it's closed, then you turn around and you work out an amortization schedule with the folks who lent you the money. And then you start making monthly payments to them. And at that same time, they can also change the title back over to my buyers without having the parents on there. Well, that's actually quite ingenious. And I don't know if it's gonna work yet, we'll see. But that's one of the offers that I have presented and it's kind of outside the box thinking. It keeps them away from the lending process. And in fact, I actually explained this to the, the listing agent. Look, this is a cash deal. What they plan on doing has nothing to do with this deal. It's gonna be outside of it. It's gonna be after closing, they're gonna work out something else. But as far as this deal is concerned, it's a cash deal, period. Yeah, well, hey, I mean, right now, offers are definitely, uh, offers and buyers are definitely having to get a little bit more creative on, on what they're doing because I mean, as you mentioned with with the first two points that you just made, you know, tugging on the, the human heartstring a little bit and playing to that human side of things can sometimes make a little bit of a difference. I think really that's that's a genius strategy to try and, um, you know, pay uh, absorb some of the seller's expenses because it kind of shows, you know, even outside of the contract, a little bit of good nature. Hey, let me, here's a helping hand. Let me lend you a little helping hand. So And, and that to me goes farther than just a love letter because a love letter is nice, but taking an action really does speak volumes for the character. And, you know, we all like to do business with people that have strong character. So to me, that is a really brilliant way to show that character. Now, it, that's not for every purchase either. I mean, a vacant house, what difference does it make? It's already a done deal. But, uh, it, excuse me, you never know what the seller might need that, that the buyer may be able to offer. Yeah. Well, wow. well, man, that, that was a, a lot of really great information, a super, super informative episode. Um, Dad, I think I'm going to hand it over to you for, for this closeout today. What do you think? Uh, sure, catch me off guard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't have anything planned for this. Now, honestly, uh, I just want to stress to everybody out there, first of all, both buyers and sellers, be patient, be professional. Uh, for the sellers, you're going to get a ton of offers. Your agent is going to filter through all of those and the cream rises to the top. They're probably going to present the top few offers to you. Everything else is they'll present them if you want to see them. You're really not going to want to take a look at all of them because it just it, it gets overwhelming. For the buyers, be patient. If this house isn't yours, don't worry about it. The next one might be. 
So just keep it up, keep doing what you're doing, keep the faith, and eventually it's going to happen. Listen to your professional agents. They know what they're doing and they're gonna do their best to try to get you into a house. Wow, great. I couldn't have said it better myself. Well, thank you guys for tuning in to the Chapel Real Estate Show. It's been a pleasure having you all and we will see you all next week. Take care. We'll see you all later. Thank you for joining us this week on the Chapel Real Estate Show. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with a friend and leave us a review. Find us on social media at Chapel Realty Group and online at chapelrealtygroup.com. Until next time.